I think more and more suppliers just need to think outside the box mm. and start like, coming up with ideas of how to engage guests on a whole different, different level because people are looking for something different now. They're not just going to eat just to, to, to eat. They want to have, uh, they want something else besides just the dining experience. Maurice, so welcome to the Wine, Whiskey and Weed show. So this is one more episode, very special episode, guys, here. We have Maurice who handles, I think I've lost the count here, but almost 20 restaurants in 30 years you've been in the industry? Uh, yeah, I've been in the industry for a very long time. Uh, we have 24 restaurants here in the original studio area. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super. So he has, I mean, you know, he's he's the, he's the sommelier, he's the wine director, he's now, you know, pretty much the buying, you know, manager and, you know, entire wine programs. We don't deep dive into the, you know, wine programs and mainly the controlled labels or private labels, you know, especially in the current context of his business, right? So we just uh, were chatting here. He mainly, uh, you know, looks for each restaurant has its own uh, persona and each restaurant has its own local profile, right? So we're going to uh, see how that fits if you're a winery and how you can approach to a customer like that, because every restaurant, as we all know, has, you know, to meet its, uh, you know, uh, definition of you know uh, the concept basically so maurice you know why don't you give a little bit of a quick uh, you know context about your journey i mean it's been a long journey so we'll have to keep it pretty much in, in like you know 30 seconds if you can 30 seconds to a minute just walk us over how you started you know what were your uh, pivotal points in your career and how you ended up uh, in this role sure yeah i think um originally i started you know the restaurant business in san francisco you know serving bartending moving to management uh learning more about wine um mm -hmm. san francisco allowed me to be uh, a great hub for traveling so my goal was always to travel so in the industry it allowed me to work and travel work and travel work and travel and during that time i learned a lot during those times uh when i moved back home to san diego i opened up a restaurant called island prime and uh I was with the cohen restaurant group and i was the wine director there for about uh eight years and then i moved up into the company and started creating a position for myself called the beverage manager position, which oversees all the other restaurants. But at that point, it was probably about 16 back then. We've grown since then, about 24. Um, all different all different concepts, like you mentioned before. Um, so even when we have like a, a name that must share a concept, share, share the same name, it has a different concept. So Got it, it might be cocktail driven or might be <laughs> wine driven what might be uh, more beer driven and stuff like that so um we're just all multiple concepts and all very different concepts so i've been here for about 13 years now no jesus <laughs> no, yeah. sorry. i've been with the company for close to 18 years now my god man you're you're like you must be the owner's uh, dream i mean like uh you know i'm sure you you would be you can't even imagine right now right like someone being uh with you for 18 years or this kind of uh, longevity, especially in the restaurant business, I mean. Yeah, you know, and, and people on my level here at the company have all probably about the same amount of time. So it's a, it's a great company to work for where it's still family owned and still uh, has that family run business part of it, which is, is a, which is great sometimes and also str uh, struggling at other times. But at the same time, it's a, we feel like we've, uh, we're part of something, you know, there's a, a oh, ownership. Let me, we have. let me, let me ask you on that itself, because I think uh, it, it personally also will help me. Uh, what, what what are the three or four main reasons why you want to continue working with this company? And you've been always, as you said, you feel home. But what what is that thing uh, that always your boss or let's say the owner or maybe whoever it is, you know, is trying to motivate you every year that, okay, this is one more step because everyone wants a little bit of uh, new things, right, as well? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a place that I'm able to use my creativity. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I really kind of shine, I think. Um, and it's really us motivating the company. And I think as a group here, we are able to do that. Um, and that's what's so, so unique about it is that they're open ears to that and, uh, and you know, give us empowerment to do that sort of thing. So I'm always looking for new ways to approach uh, our programs, our, mm -hmm. we'll approach our, 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 our labor and our work force, um, our employees. And um, I think that's what the main thing is, is that, you know, there's a way for, there's a, a place where my voice is heard. And also I'm able to use my creativity to, you know, move forward. And it's kind of like, it's like my company in a way, you know. Nice, so, nice, nice. That brings me to ask you about your uh, KPIs, right? You, you know, like you must have to meet some deliverables, you know, uh, business-wise, like profits, revenues, and so on, right? Uh, what what exactly are your KPIs? Like, you know, what are you responsible for overall? Like, is there a metric you can share, like a minimum 
for gross profit margins you have to maintain, you know, uh, whatever it is, like, you know, beverage amount of sales from the food menu, you know, so just share us some uh, KPIs of your role. You know, every restaurant is different. So I think mm-hmm. every restaurant has its own KPI. Um, I think that we're, um, and I think we take it uh, restaurant by restaurant. So okay. it's hard to say what it is overall because there really isn't one. Every single one has a different, because it's a different concept, it's a different way we approach that restaurant. We had to come up with a different way of, of looking at it. Now, right now, my main goal is to make sure that our profits are continue to increase top line sales mm-hmm. increasing our poor costs are are in line and um and that changes by restaurant to restaurant because some might have higher and lower post poor costs and it's most important right now is really also trying to see how do we get uh, our employees to stick with us uh, to to retention with their employees so those are the things that i'm really looking for so the things i try to use in programs the things i try to use in programming um uh, beverages is how do i incorporate that so that my employees feel part of it my managers are actually uh, involved with the programs um and it's not Very just hey, this, this, is, this is what we're doing and this is how it's going to happen you know i want mm-hmm. them to be part of the entire process so i think that's important just like my owner lets me to have that control over our programming i want my managers also to have their control over their own restaurants as well so uh on, on the beverage programs right like you know you would be doing a yearly audit or you know something like let's say you have uh i'm just throwing a number here maybe let's say 40 skus you know out of that 10 were like really bad performers you know 10 were really good performers and maybe 20 were like you know meeting the the numbers so how do you you know evaluate evaluate and how do you go about this whole decision making of okay this 10 has to go next 10 has to come and whatnot like what's your review process of the year let's say yeah um i you know (laughs) it's it's very different because it's again all different concepts and all different so we don't have like the same brands in every single restaurant we do is my program is based on suppliers so i work within suppliers so that my teams actually order within that supplier now some suppliers might over deliver and other ones under deliver. So at this point, like for example, right now I'm going through the RFP process. This is when I start deciding which of those are uh, are over delivering and continue on with us, and which mm-hmm. of those are under delivering that will not go continue on with. And then which newer suppliers or new suppliers are bringing something to the table that's going to be uh, uh, you know important for us or or something that's going to kind of really kind of. Um, take us to the next level. And, you know, that can be in all kinds of different things. It can be pricing, it can be quality of product, it can be uh, 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 the support for like uh, events and um, and when we'll talk about private labels, the things we do with private labels, the support they have with those sorts of things. Uh, but it, it goes into a, a, a lot larger kind of like overview. My skews, I'm not thinking, oh, well, this Chardonnay didn't do very well. That's Chardonnay, you know, because I put a Chardonnay by the glass in the, Ten to fifteen dollar range, it's gonna over, it's gonna it's gonna profit. You know, we're gonna mm. do with really well. it. It doesn't matter uh, if I put a, a New Zealand side on block in there. It's gonna be we're gonna sell a lot of it. Now finding the right ones and and making sure the price is correct and all that. That's that's kind of like what we I empower my managers to do that mm-hmm. uh, and the concept. But um, overall, I think we don't look at SKUs in general. We look at I look more at suppliers and see which ones are the ones are going to be coming in and uh, being worthwhile with us understood so you prefer to work with uh you know less suppliers and their products instead of changing you know uh the products and then look for a supplier for that product yeah yeah Yeah. cool uh you say you know uh what you're looking for in the suppliers and usually the you know the rfps you know the, the the type of the requirement right so where does this go like is this private or you know uh is this public information can suppliers you know know what you're looking for yeah, I usually uh, send out an RFP, and that's going to be like a, a, a program request that I send out to everybody. And in that program request, it tells them exactly what I'm looking for. Um, it lets them know more about our company, how we work, um, how our, our, our restaurants. I put everything in tiers, so we have different different levels of tiers. For example, like um, a restaurant that does a lot of wine volume would be a tier one wine restaurant, but they might be a tier two spirit restaurant. Or some restaurants might be tier one, tier tier one in spirits, tier one in spirit and wine, tier one in beer, because they do a lot of volume and all, all those sorts of things. So I let my suppliers know where they fall into and what I'm looking for for each one. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I think right this year has been really unique in that I've been really looking at experience-based um, 
uh, value. That's what I'm mm-hmm. looking for right now. I want my I want our guests that are coming back after COVID to come back and have an experience, have an emotional connection with us, and not just coming in for dinner. And we're just oh hi, welcome, take your order, and let's move on. I want to see something go beyond that. I want to have like mm-hmm. I, want, I want to empower my teams, my partners, my servers to be able to go to the table and provide something that they wouldn't be able to normally provide without having mm-hmm. to ask a manager for approval. Just be able to take care of them. And so my suppliers come up with an ideas from like that. So who knows? Maybe it's like giving them a playlist of Spotify, uh, of like the favorite songs of the of the restaurant. Or maybe it's like a, um, uh, uh, I don't know. It's it, we're, we're playing with all different different ideas that we're doing. So um, I'm really creating uh, uh, experience based ideas or mm. uh, for for our guests. And so that all goes in RFPs. And then, for example, it's up to the supplier to figure out how they can, you know, uh, give this kind of. Uh, you know, uh, let's say experience, maybe, you know, they bring in a winemaker playing guitar, I'm just saying, but overall, sure. you want you want suppliers to help you uh, in creating an experience. That's one example, right? Uh, right. Uh, but this RFP goes to the current suppliers, right? Uh, doesn't go to the new suppliers. Yeah, it'll go out to anybody who's looking to sit with me. So throughout the year, I collect, uh, I collect people's information, okay. emails, and the in at nice. the, uh, Time of the year in October, November is when I send these out and I send it out to everybody and say, this is so what I'm people, looking for. People who are prospecting with you, you know, uh, maybe on LinkedIn DMs or email phone calls or whatever it is, you know, that you have a list, you you log them as an inbound and you, you just make a note. Like as a right. buyer, you know, what's your process? If I just cold call you, you know, and obviously, you know, I you got pissed and you don't want to save my information and, and some other guy you like and you save that information is that what you do or do you save no matter what who has contacted you everyone's information in your log um well i think it's 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 not that i don't like them or i don't it's nothing like that i I mean you know you know what i mean like uh you uneducated supplier basically that you don't want to waste your time yeah no, I think what it has to be is make sure, first of all, it's, it's got to be suppliers can be my distribution network. So that's the first thing I ask. Because I'm okay. not going to go and start a new distributor just to get one item in for 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 multiple restaurants. It's, just, it's just not fair to the management team. It's not fair to my accounting team, invoicing team. I don't need to give them more of that stuff. So got it. it's going to be within our current uh, distribution network. It's the first thing I ask. Um, and also, I think that I'm also not in the, pl- in the place to, to really try to build brands you know mm-hmm. i'm not there to be the one to okay we're gonna put this out and it's gonna be the the number one the the, the thing we're gonna you know build your brand i think it's more about um uh, and those are those one-off things that might only have like we only have a vodka and that's what i want to do or we only have, we, we specialize in you know italian wine well i don't I, don't really use a lot of Italian wine, or I don't just use a lot of uh, one one country wine. I want to be able to have multiple uh, rounded program or supplier that has several items that can work in multiple concepts, not just in one concept. You know? So I do get a list together, and then uh, those those they kind of qualify within that list. I will send it out to them, and then they get the RFP, and then they reach out versus uh, a calendar invite where they just can sign up for calendar times, and I have like anywhere between 30 to 45 minute slots and we just have a uh, uh, meetings and, and review their, their proposals. And they get one shot like once a year sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much. They get the okay. shot and then, um, and then we go back and forth in conversations. If I'm really interested in, I'll come, I'll call back and we'll do more conversations. And then I, I also have as a, um, what we call is our, our beverage calendar, where we have all the events and all the promotions and all the activations that we do throughout the year, which I share with marketing and my marketing team kind of, uh, uh, expounds upon it and as the things they want to do we share with our suppliers and our suppliers come in and say well we want to do this we want to do this dinner we want to do this event we want to mm-hmm. you know uh, do this promotion or this EL- lto and they sign up for those and we put them into that calendar i understood so just to dissect this in a in a clear way so i i get that for the people uh you know the, for the current suppliers who already are working with you you know they can access your yearly marketing activity and then they can select, hey, maybe I can contribute here. I can contribute here. And then that way you have a yearly plan as well. You can log the deals. You can, you know, use their support. And then you can sort of plan your programming well in advance, right? Correct. Yeah. Got it. And for the new suppliers that you're planning to meet, you know, based on the RFPs, they can also see your marketing and maybe say, hey, I can do that, that and consider my wine. Yeah, and a lot of times those newer suppliers might come with new ideas or new things we haven't done before, you know. Right. And it's always it's always fun and, and exciting to hear something that people bring to the table. And and sometimes to, 
that little that little extra something gives you a foot into the door, you know? You know, uh, let's go on the pre-qualifications, right? Like you said, one of the things that you have to uh, be in your distribution network, which makes sense. Like, you know, you, you're you working with this 10, 15 distributors. You just want to just not open new more, you know, accounts. Like, so what are the other uh, pre-qualifications? Like you also said local, so maybe has to be, you know, uh, uh, a, a big brand or can should be a local or what are your other like five to six minimum uh, pre-qualifications or, or just say qualification criteria otherwise it's not part of the you know uh, list no i think that the supplier has to have um a variety of products so it's mm-hmm. not just uh, a one product i just not Understood. i just not, i don't just make it wrong well it, you know Maybe it's a rum producer that makes some spectacular rum that I have to use, but it'd probably be something to have in the restaurants. I'm going to I'm going to program across the board because I want my teams to be able to make their choices amongst their restaurant for their concept. So I want to give them um, a, a supplier base that's going to have multiple items they can choose from. For example, mm. if I'm if I have one of my restaurants is a Mexican based restaurant and another one is a a, a beer based restaurant, well. I'm not going to program um, a tequila in all my restaurants because tequila A belongs to this supplier. I want that supplier to also have maybe something like a, a whiskey or something that goes better in the beer restaurant. So that way they, that supplier is getting, uh, uh, is able to kind of fit into all the restaurants. If I just have them, you know, put one here, one there, we interviewed a lot, a lot of suppliers and there's no, it's no, it's possible for one person like myself to control all that and kind of oversee That makes it. sense. And yeah. So, 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 so you, think, pref- you, you prefer like importers or larger portfolio houses, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, if, if someone's an importer, you know, are they, do they, if they're bringing in things from South America, do they also have something from New Zealand? Do they also have something from, from Europe? You know, that's always really helpful because it, it helps me to place them in different areas where the French restaurant might be doing some French wines and then the, the, uh, the, the Mexican restaurant might be doing some South American wines. So mm. that, that's a good point. I think that can be used, uh, you know, if they, if they have a good portfolio that can be used in a very, different way when they're pitching you and making the presentations like okay you know this restaurant i saw uh does good in mexican beers maybe i have that mexican beer that restaurant has rum i have that rum and so on uh any other criteria like you know uh does it have to be what about the pickup locations or you know have to be uh rush orders or minimum any other technical things that hey do you if, if i need a one case price or one case delivery or overnight any other like things that you ask them yeah, well, that's usually through the distributor more than the supplier, okay. you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, so the distributor really has to deal with that. That's why it has to be within our distribution network because I already have those partnerships set up. So if I have case one pricing or, or whatever it might be, it's already set up with the distributor. Well, what about those. vintage uh, locking or supply planning? Or you ask them that, hey, I need four four pallets just for me. Make sure you don't go out of supply and so on. You know, yeah. you- there, there has to be stock of things. And, and, you know, right now it's challenging because uh, no one really knows what the, happens down, uh, in the future. But um, I think things are getting better. But, okay. yeah, absolutely. You have a, a stock on things, um, you know, and then... <laughs> No matter how much we plan for that, I, I've never, uh, I don't, I, it's still always going to be an issue, I think, you know. Let, let's go on the meeting side, Maurice, right? Like, let, let's say you got, uh, I got your attention. Now I got a chance to meet you. I'm a supplier. I have a good portfolio. I, I know what you're looking for and I have that portfolio. Now it, it's a meeting. Now, do you prefer to meet, uh, let's say, uh, my sales manager or you you actually prefer to meet the owner or maybe the winemaker or the distiller? Does it help if I bring you the actual maker as well in the meeting as a courtesy or maybe as a sales or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think that the one thing that I, I dislike the most is when people don't really know their product. Because if I want to ask you about like how something is distilled, I want you to tell me how it's distilled. You know, I want to know the, the nitty gritty information. And sometimes those distillers have that information. However, the, the marketing manager or the, the sales rep also needs to know the pricing and needs to know the availability, which the distiller might have not have that uh, access to that. So I think um, it's important to have maybe a little bit of both. Um, mm. uh, I think sometimes when they get meetings that they come like, you know, five or six people all at one time and they're all different positions. I kind of, you know, some people feel overwhelmed. I kind of enjoy it because I can, I can see like, 
you know, how their company works and see mm-hmm. how that actually works. And, 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 you know, and you can see that the, you know, if, if someone doesn't know the answer, somebody else might know the answer. And it's, it's rather than someone not knowing the answer, they sitting in front of you and has to text or has to come, get back to me next week, you know, with, a, with an answer. So uh, I prefer to have it all there all at once. What do you call a, a well-prepared supplier? Like, you know, uh, give us a, give us a couple of examples or some some meeting that you recall saying, all right, this guy's got that perfectly. I think it's someone who knows my restaurant group, first of all, have to know the restaurants, know how, um, you know, the, the differences between each one um, is very important because I think that people come to me so often, almost like I'm a cheesecake factory or something like that, where it's plug in one and you have it all, all the places. It doesn't work that way. I, it, I'm not set up that way. We're, we're, we're all unique concepts. So people don't understand that. First of all, is then come in with that, uh, knowing my restaurants. Um, the second part of it is to read, read the RFP and understand what we're looking for. Um, a lot of times, uh, I think a lot of times, uh, Time is wasted by giving me the history of the company and giving me about their their outlook, their futures, and all these different things. It's like you know what, I understand you're building your company up, but the, let's get to the nitty gritty of it. Let's talk about the, the products. Let's talk about the uh, um, uh, uh, the value you have to to bring to 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 the table, um, whether it's experience based or whatever whatever the RFP is looking for. Get right to that part of it, um, and. Um, and I think a lot of times, um, <laughs> the you know, your, your, your salesman, you're trying to build up your, um, you come with a lot of compliments and, oh, my God, you guys are amazing. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. But let's not waste time. We have 30 minutes. Let's get right to it. And let's get right into it and make sure you read the RFP. Pretty much just the most important thing. So, you know, we are, we are in the meeting. I got 30 minutes and I opened my presentation. So slide one, let's say just a quick you know, uh, two minutes about us, history, story. And then I move straight. If I was, you know, your supplier, I would straight away show you the RFP and I would show here's a gap and analysis. Here's what I've done. Here's where I see a good fit, you know, and why I see a good fit. I show the margins. I show, you know, the cost structure and then slide maybe four. I show the support programs. Uh, What else do you think? Like what else can I put like three or four more things that can add value? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, all I said there is the most important thing. Um, I, I mean, that's that's really it right there. Is the, uh, that's the nitty gritty. You know? what, what about like you know uh, things like hey, you know what, you know, give me a chance. You know, two weeks, uh, two months, it doesn't move. You know, I'll I'll do this five things. Like, are, what are the five things that they can do? You know, if it's not moving really good, like if if the wines are just not moving, they're not getting repeat purchases. You know, uh, can you suggest or give some ideas to the suppliers that hey, this has worked, where you know you can help us and you know it can get the traction back. Well, I think what it is, um, again, we are a, a company that's really regional, so everything is like in kind of in our air, in our area here. And um, and because our program is set up where it's not just like one blanket statement where everything uh, I picked this Chardonnay and this Chardonnay goes into a restaurant or this Pinot Noir goes into a restaurant it doesn't work that way. Um, so it's important for the supplier to be able to be have whether the person I'm meeting with or they have a team that's going to be on the floor activating and working within the restaurants. That is super important because mm-hmm. the ones that that are in the restaurants and meeting with the managers. Those are the ones that get the volume. Those are the ones that are going to start, you know, seeing movement. If they just figure it's going to be like, oh, when well, Marie said it's going to be on a program, so now we're on program, and then the restaurants are picking their wines out. They're picking out. They pick their the Riesling. They pick their Chenin Blanc. They pick the they pick a a, 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 a red blend, and they're not moving well because. They can sit with their team and find the right wine that move. Well, they should put the Chardonnay in that restaurant. They should put the Pinot Noir in the restaurant. The Malbec, you know, the things that actually move rather than like. Um, letting the team just pick out the reasoning or something like that. And then all of a sudden they met their mandate and there, uh, but there's no volume there, but that comes down to suppliers. Suppliers, um, a lot of times, I, mean, I would say more than 50% of them, uh, as soon as the RFP is done, the presentation's done, they're done. And they just, they might show for an event somewhere or they might show for a dinner somewhere, but that they're not in the restaurants where they need to be doing that, especially accounts like mine, where they're all different concepts and they're all so small within regional and the managers have so much uh, autonomy. They have to have be there and be within those restaurants. It's really important. Uh, private labels, right? Uh, 
how how much of a private label business do you do? I know sometimes you know some restaurants are a fan of private labels. Maybe some prefer brands because they just get footfalls. You know. So what's your what's your take on twenty twenty three? What are you doing with private labels? Well, I've had, I've had a lot of uh, issues with private labels. Um, and um, I mean, what went wrong? Um, first of all, is uh, the distributors not being on the same page as the supplier and not picking things up when they need to be picked up and the PO is not going through. Um, and then there's miscommunications. And when, you know, as as people leave companies and you build up a relationship with a particular person in a company, and then that person is no longer there. And all of a sudden there's no one there to pick up to understand what was happening before. There's no communication within their company. So there isn't that, that that's become an issue. I think that that's, that's the main thing is, is supply, you know, when they promise something that's not there. Um, mm. However, the ones that have been really successful are the ones that I do here locally. The ones that I, I work with, the wineries that are nearby within, um, you know, an hour and a half, two hours uh, driving distance where we can actually go and work with the wineries directly and, and have them produce wines for us. Those are the most valuable ones, I think, um, because what I'm looking for is experience for my, my employees. My employees go and harvest. My employees go and crush. Mm. My employees are part of the blending part of it. It's, it's their wine. It's not just me buying juice and putting a label on it that might look cool. It's really about, you know, the employees getting in there and understanding sure. and being able to say, you know, I was part of that and show on their phone. Here's my, uh, here's a picture of us actually harvesting, you know, I want yeah. that. I want yeah. my, my guests to connect with them that way, you know. How how do a supplier pitch uh, a private label? Like, what should be a first, you know, uh, elevator pitch without, you know, that that can get you excited? Like, let's say if I was, I wanted to offer private label, but I don't know that Maurice wants private label. Uh, how do I approach you? It's just going to be the right, the right thing, the right one at the right time. I think is what it comes down to. Um, Which means if you can't find it anywhere uh like that and then i say hey i'll bring it i'm the broker i'll figure this mm -hmm. out for you yeah for example let's say uh for looking for a chardonnay or cabernet i'm just not super interested in that sort of thing um unless it's very valuable unless it's the juice is extremely good and the price is extremely good um mm -hmm. and there's there's um and i'm able to actually have uh, availability of it and backup availability of it um, also minimums are difficult because again, every restaurant's a different concept. I'm not going to have that in every single restaurant. It would be in some of the more wine centric restaurants, but so the volume might not be as high as people are looking for, you know, 2000, 3000 bottle, um, mm -hmm. cases, um, private labels. And uh, I'm not going to be able to do, um, 3000 cases of, of private labels within, uh, a set amount of concepts because although we have 24 concepts they're not going to be in every single those, those ones will be in every single one of those concepts will be in particular concepts they belong to um so i look for smaller volumes um and i look for uh things that are going to be again um uh good juice <laughs> i think it's mm -hmm. very important because if i'm putting my label on it it's and we, and I rather make our own labels or create our own labels and have our mm -hmm. design team do it. Um, because if I'm going to put my, my our label on something, I want it to be definitely worth <laughs> what's in the bottle and mm -hmm. um, and the price has got to be good. So, I think what I'm hearing is let's say you know, if, if I was a branded supplier and for some reason everything was perfect except my label, which you didn't like. I can always say that, hey, you know, if you don't like the label, I'll make a private label for you. But rest all factors are there, for example. You know, mm -hmm. so I think they can use uh, in many ways, right, to offer you private label in case if it actually boils down to the brand uh, label package if you don't like, you know. But you already may have some preconcepts made and we can just put the juice in that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do, you, do you have any private labels right now in your restaurant? Yep. Yeah. So how, yeah. what, what, what's the programming? Let's say, how do you push what, you know, what kind of uh, things are you telling your sommeliers and wine directors? What's your hand selling uh, technique for private label? Well, I think it's um, mostly that the fact that um, it's good juice and mm -hmm. there's a story behind each one of them. Um, our Pinot Grigio, uh, we were importing from Italy, directly from Italy. So it's kind of like, um, when we were able to, we were able to work a program out where the importer was able to bring it in for us, and uh, and warehousing was uh, didn't go to distribution, so that was really uh, a benefit for us, where we're 
getting pretty much FOB pricing on some of that. And when Pinot Grigio, it's really, you know, it's a it's a it's a wine that people just order by the varietal and not by a label. So it made a lot of sense for us. Um, another one we do is uh, a rosé that we do here locally here in mm -hmm. San Diego, where mm -hmm. we actually to go and harvest and we crush and we bring everything in and uh, do the blending. And that's been really successful because there's uh, social media behind it. There's uh, uh, staff engagement. Um, and of course it's uh, the, the volumes aren't very, very high, but at the same time, it's something that we keep, we have consistent stock. We know how much we have for each year and then we can re up it every year. Uh, another one we have is out of Baja, California. We go down to the Valle of Guadalupe and we uh, have a winery work directly with there. And we, we go through barrels and select barrels and the wine changes over time. Uh, we're always doing a, a red blend out of there and mm -hmm. that blend will change um, throughout the year. But it's every time I take somebody new with me. So there's always a new a new uh, buyer, right. a new someone to go with me to kind of be part of that experience. So again, they're part of the experience of eating and dining and, and also uh, doing the blend. And that makes a, a really, really useful, unique for us. And um, and then um, I'm looking at two other things right now. Uh, I'm just not sure where it's going to go, but I'm looking for some Malbec from Argentina and also at... Uh, Malbec, you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I guess and you picked up on the on the emotional vein of the Argentina. Now you're going to sell some Malbecs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that had nothing to do with that, but yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah, got it. No, um, yeah, so we have a, there was a, a, a proposal that came my way that I'm, I'm still trying to see if it works out. So what are your predictions on the varietals of 2023? What's going to, you know, what, what are the hot varietals? What's your take on just, you know, throw some three or four trends that you see popping? Goodness. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, it's a hard question because if you're looking at sales, it's always going to be sure. But, but let's say you said Malbec, right? There must be something. You say, why did you say Malbec? Oh, because um, no, something got came to my uh, came towards me, and I, and, uh, and it's. Um, I mean, Malbec, uh, I think actually Malbec is not on a trend. I think it's actually going backwards. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I think this is so much so much. Bad Malbec is coming to the country that I think that people okay. are starting to cut up with it. But I'm looking for some really high quality Salta, um, high elevation Malbec that can add for a higher level um, wine, uh, higher so, tier. So let me ask uh, you, rephrase the question, actually. What do you think customers will ask for more going into 20, you know, in the first half of 2023 let's say you know what do you think just hey do you have this do you have that what, what's what do you, what's your gut feeling i don't know i think um i think things that uh, i've been seeing an increase in albarino i think albarino is going to be uh, uh uh people are becoming more understand what that varietal is about i i wish that <laughs> i wish that people would be turned on to chocolate um i love chocolate and if we can get people to order chocolate that'd be fantastic so we can put with ceviches and put it with our uh, our crudos and stuff like that but um uh, uh, as far as and red wines i think that um uh, I, I don't know uh, i think people are might even are, are starting to uh look for more uh, french wines now than they used to and seeing more increase in like uh grenache um people would turn towards grenache both from spain and from france i've seen an increase in uh, uh you know rome varietals and rome uh, wines um Definitely seen uh, people looking for that stuff. You know, I'm in, a, in an area where it was always very California based, you know, um, but I think that now uh, more and more uh, consumers are being more educated and they're looking for more unique varietals. I think that, you know, Chenin Blanc mm -hmm. and uh, all these things that have always been around. What about how it's like, what's your take on, you know, uh, three or four categories that you think will be hot? Well, I mean, uh, mezcal and tequila are always raising. They're always kind of increasing. I know that's been the trend for a while, but I, I've kind of always been on that mezcal trend for a very long time. If, uh, it's my favorite spirit. Um, I like to see it, like seeing it kind of grow. At the same time, I don't want to see it grow because mm -hmm. I feel it's just going to raise prices and also uh, make it uh, less ac uh, accessible for um, uh 
you know, the, the smaller producers down in, 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 in Oaxaca and other parts of Mexico. But uh, the other thing too, I think is a uh, non-alcoholic, um, mm. non-alcoholic spirits are going to probably be something that we start seeing more of it as well. I think that's going to be a, a big thing where people are going to be ordering, you know, martinis and, and margaritas and, 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 uh, and uh, Negronis with using um, non-alcoholic spirits rather than uh, uh, full spirits. I think that's a, a trend. Um, and, you know, whiskey has always been uh, um, moving and always kind of been growing for the last several, uh, you know, last 10 years. Um, and I think that's still continue to, to grow as well um, and continue to go in there. What are the three or four memories that you remember uh, that a supplier may have done, which you thought that really good, this, this guys have maintained a good relationship, you know, or, or a tactical and actionable way, you, you know, like let's say me sending you a, a t- you know, th- uh, Merry Christmas email on 24th and Happy New Year, you know, message on 31st, for example, you know, w- yeah. what are some th- four, three or four things that you can just suggest that wineries can do to, you know, show a good intent, okay, not a sales intent, like show a good intent. I think the ones, like I said before, the ones that are in my properties, the ones that actually go and know my managers by name, those are the big ones. You can come to me all day long and, you know, and, 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 and you know, say thank you or, or it doesn't do anything i want my teams to feel right. you know wanted i want my teams that feel that that kind of connection stuff that's what it really matters to me is, is them you know nice nice super stuff anything else uh we've not touched do you want to say anything no i think that you know um you know it, my company is so different it's a, it's a unique small kind of like a multiple concept company but it, you know, the one thing is because where we're at, we can do so many things that are so creative mm-hmm. and we're always looking for things that are completely different. So, uh, I, you know, I think more and more suppliers just need to think outside the box mm-hmm. and start like, coming up with ideas of how to engage guests on a whole never, different level because people are looking for something different now. They're not just going to eat just to, to, to eat. They want to have... Uh, they want something else besides just the dining experience, right? And um, and I think that's getting more and more easier to do with technology and and uh, and the way that that, uh, that people are going out to eat now that we can start thinking outside the box. So I'm really excited about this year to see what we come up with and uh, and and see what happens. So. 